Welcome back to Podcast Bozo, where week after week, three bozos teach each other new things and learn from astonishing guests like you. Uh, today, we're talking to Eric Berger, the senior space editor at Ars Technica. Uh, he wrote the acclaimed book, Liftoff, which is about SpaceX beginnings, SpaceX's beginnings. He also is a Pulitzer-nominated journalist, and he has a lot of other work going on out there, too. Uh, I'm your host, JJ. I'm here with Eli, our resident artist and our transitional drifter slash part-time worker, Corey. Before we put our sweet lips in motion, we want to encourage you to contribute to the conversation, communicate with us over the social medias or our website. Uh, you can find us at podcastbozo.com or at podcastbozo on any of our social media. Uh, speaking of our website, go there, donate. We'll read whatever you write in the donation message. Uh, write you a little backstory, and if you're not sure what that means, donate to find out. Plus, that money all goes back into the production and distribution of the podcast. So thank you, Eric. Thank you for sitting through our self-serving stuff. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, JJ. How are you? That's that's good to hear. Uh, we're all doing well, too, I'd assume. I don't know about Corey, but... Um, yeah, Corey, Corey, Corey's in space, but... <laughs> Um, but so are you in Houston right now? I am in Houston right now. That's nice. right. And you full time it there, yeah? I full time full time. <laughs> yeah, I've lived here lived here for more than twenty years. So I guess so. Nice. Do you like the Texas <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Alright, let me rephrase it. Eric, how do you like the Texas life? <laughs> you know, I like the Texas life. I, I grew up in Michigan. I came down to the University of Texas for school and I've pretty much stayed here ever since. So You went you went back to your masters in Michigan, yeah? Uh, Missouri, Missouri, uh, so like right. halfway, halfway in between. And I got back to Texas. Nice. nice. <laughs> oh, wait, everyone always comes back to Texas. Back. <laughs> uh, Eli and I have an obsession with Texas. Uh, we take frequent road trips down there to like the Panhandle area and like the Stratford, Dumas, Dalhart areas. Um, we just, we love the rusty old culture in like the smaller towns in Northern Texas. So sorry. That's our connection there. Corey, you ever been to Texas? I've been to Texas plenty of times. Um, I am a big fan. Got a bunch of family that attended the University of Texas. Hook them, you know. Yeah. Um, Yeah. (laughs) So I'm I'm on board with the Texas train. Nice. Well, Eric, I guess uh, our opening question, this was actually Corey's question. I'm about to rob it, is um, it's funny to see. First of all, we've we've spoken with... uh, a former like NASA, NASA journalists and um, people like, I don't know. Have you ever, have you ever met Robin C. Mangle? That's someone we've had on the show yep. before. Yeah. yeah. So he, um he, he's been on the show before. He was a great guy. Um, fun to talk to him. But we, one question that always rings in my head when we talk to uh, people like you is what, what obviously what got you into space? So you were, you're an astronomy major, right? In, in, uh, in college. And then you moved to journalism to make it practical is what I heard. But what, what's, what's your story there? You know, my story is that just when I was a kid, I was, you know, transfixed by this stuff. Uh, I remember, boy, this would have been a long time ago. Um, late 1970s, early 1980s, I wrote a letter to NASA um, and at the time, like you could write them a letter and they would send you pictures, like real photos um, that cool. had been taken by the Voyager probes, which at that time were brand new, the fact that they were out there. Um, and so it was, uh, I wrote to them and I got pictures of, of Venus and, uh, and Saturn and just, you know, pretty, pretty amazing stuff. Um, and... I just, you know, it's, it always stuck with me. I was always fascinated by space. And so, you know, that led me to astronomy and this long tangled road that, that got me into journalism. And, and now, you know, I discovered probably over the last 10 years of my career that, that covering space flight and getting really deep into the weeds was what I wanted to do. Was, was astronomy for you just studying something you were passionate about and then you moved to journalism because... <laughs> you wanted to apply it to something or when did you transit? When did you frame that in your head? Yeah. Astronomy was for me, like I, I couldn't really figure out what I wanted to major in college. And that was what I was most interested in. I think it's because I had good teachers in high school discovered by the end of my junior year that it was all physics and calculus. It was very, very, very <laughs> little astronomy and astronomy major. Um, and so I, I, just that summer after my junior year, I was talking at, at this event. And I ran into a journalism professor and he's like, oh, you know, you like to write. You got to think about journalism. And so I, I transitioned with the idea of writing about science. And that's what I did for a long time at the Houston Chronicle before focusing more on space. 
Yeah. And were you, this, this confused me because you, you were nominated for a Pulitzer for your coverage in, of, um, Hurricane Ike. Just, Ike. There you go. I just lost the name right on, right when I was supposed to say it. Um, thank you for <laughs> tuning in there. Um, but yeah, you, 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 I, I read the description of why you're nominated. It was because you were very clever and illustrative in how you used all the technologies that you're disposable to kind of broadcast that and including the recovery, um, which is something that I feel that a lot of people lack. And um, when you think back on that nomination, what was, what kind of attributed, what, what was your proudest part of your work that, of that coverage? Well, cast your mind back to 2008, if you can. And the hot trend on the internet was not social media or TikTok or something like this. It was, <laughs> it was, um, it was blogging. And I had, you know, worked for a newspaper, but moved into blogging about weather at the time. And it was just remarkable to see the response from people who liked getting information that was very real like not hyped up, not sensationalistic and, and sort of you know, this no hype coverage. And so that, that's, that's what basically, you know, I was there during Ike, which was a major storm for the Houston region um, in terms of storm surge. So it was, it was basically just sort of keeping people informed minute by minute. And it was, it was really interesting because, you know, as a newspaper, when you're trying to compete on weather with television, Again, this is this is 13 years ago, so so the world has changed a lot since then. But you know, at the time, you know, newspapers couldn't keep up with TV because we would write our stories and they'd be come out 12 hours later. Um, and so, this blogging medium allowed me to do real time information about the storm and communicate with people like that. And so, it was pretty powerful. Yeah, it's cool. I, I, if I remember that time at all, my, my actually my my real exposure was a couple years after, but online stories started moving towards this like um a different way of than just being like a blog on a browser that you scroll through there was uh they were kind of moving towards being more immersive and um as described uh with yours like using more more of the tools you have at your disposal when you're when you are a publication um and i know a lot of yours was um I guess I don't know this. I want you to answer. Um, were you were you on the ground for a lot of this? I know you currently own a um, a news network online that you consider to be the non no nonsense of um, of weather <laughs> forecasting. And uh, I, I'm just curious. Uh, do you how, how dirty do you get your hands with that? I, I'm not a storm chaser, man. That's not my thing. Mm -hmm. I like to sit back and and look at the forecast data. And really, my thing is not. You're standing out there with the winds blowing and the water coming up. It's it's communicating with people, um, yeah. and 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 writing and sharing with people what they can expect. Um, so yeah, it's you'll never find me in a in a pickup truck tearing down a back highway in Kansas tr trying to get in the middle of a twister. I'd be I'd be going the other way. <laughs> yeah, my imagination had you. Oh, go ahead, Corey. Oh yeah. I was going to say, what is that connection for uh, space and weather for you? Is there is it just two separate things that you fancied or was there some line between the two that like really pulled those pulled you between them? Yeah, no, it's, it's that's it's kind of crazy because um, in Houston, I'm much, much, much more well known for the weather stuff. Um, and then nationally, it's much more space. Um, but it's, it's just two things that I was passionate about and I've been fortunate enough to have careers in both areas and, and very rarely they meet like on launch day when there's a scrub of a launch due to weather, then I can sort of the two come, <laughs> come together <Yeah. laughs> or like if there's a hurricane threatening Kennedy space center, but that's about it. It's usually like one sort of weather forecasting. And, and on the other hand, it's like writing about space. And I'm just super amazingly fortunate to be able to be involved in both and, and make a career out of both of them. And, you know, it's, it's just chase your passions and, and find your career there. So technically speaking with your background, um, how, how deep into the technical aspects of both these fields are you able to get? Like if you, if someone gave you a very detailed uh, like blueprint of um, of a rocket ship, would you be able to point the parts out? 
Um, if, if you're talking about weather, if you're looking at just like a blank weather pattern, can you, can you analyze that and tell us what's coming in? Like how, how deep can you get into those things? So meteorology, I can get pretty deep. Um, yeah. in, in terms of forecasting, looking at maps or model data, um, definitely with a sort of a scientist's eye. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's from a forecast standpoint, pretty, pretty deep into the details on, on the space side, it's, it's more of a policy thing, less of an engineering thing. I, I mean, I can tell you the different parts of a rocket, but how they all work, uh, I mean, on the inside, no, that's, that's not my thing. My thing is really sort of understanding what's happening in, in aerospace, what what's driving the changes we're seeing and, and what's holding it up and, and, you know, who's messing around and who's really trying to get ahead and, and sort of figuring all that out and then, then telling people what's really happening. Like, you know, cause in space, man, there's just, first of all, there's an incredible amount of hype. Uh, lots of companies promising lots of things and most of it's BS. Um, and so it's, it's making sense of that. And it's also understanding the policy side of things because you know money, funding from NASA and the department of defense drives so much innovation and so much of the programs that we see companies competing for in space that you really need to know, you know, who's pushing what and why and what it means. And, and that's sort of what I try to really dig in deep and figure out. So who do you think so is at kind uh, of the apex uh, of, of space, you know, exploration or development right now, whether that's a country or a, a, a business? What are you so there's three key, there's, there's three really premier players, I would say. I would put NASA at the top of the list um, because they have the premier deep space capability. Um, their their record of exploring Mars and the outer planets is, is no one comes close to that. It's, it's absolutely stellar. Um, and NASA, of course, is, is runs the International Space Station. Russia is a you know, co-partner, but really it's, it's a NASA-led program. Um, and, and they're funding a lot of things. They're trying to go back to the moon. So, so NASA leads. China, I would put right there at number two. Um, they have had a long-term plan, and they're executing that plan. We've seen it with their very impressive landing on the surface of Mars this past week. Only NASA has ever put a rover down on the surface of Mars that sort of has walked away from the spacecraft um, or even made a soft landing on Mars. Russia tried many times. Soviet Union, excuse me, tried many times and failed, and, and Europe has tried a couple of times and failed. So the fact that China landed its um, Zhurong rover is, is quite impressive. They've also done some really interesting things on the moon and they've just launched their own space station. Um, so they're, they're very, you know, they're, they're, they're certainly up and coming. They're not up with NASA. And then number three, I would put uh, SpaceX. Um, you could, they would rank as a space agency of their own um, at this point because they have the rocket, the Falcon 9, that launches far more than any other rocket in the world. It's the only one that's reusable, only orbital rocket that's reusable. They have the largest rocket in the world with the Falcon Heavy, uh, most powerful. They, you know, they, they, with Starlink, they have more satellites than any other company or country in the world. Um, and so, you know, trying to deploy this global internet satellite. Um, they launch most of NASA's cargo missions. They launch all of their crew members right now, although Boeing will come along at some point. And they're building the Starship vehicle, which, you know, if it's fully realized, would be absolutely revolutionary in terms of its capabilities. They've got a ways to go, but, you know, they're making progress. It's about what that would be like yes so so if starship works it would be the first time in my mind that we actually see something ripped from the pages of science fiction come into real life because think about the lunar module right which landed on the moon in the 1960s and early 70s and took two astronauts down to the surface of the moon at the time if you strip the crew components away from that and just use that to land cargo on the moon. The study was done. You could get maybe eight to 10 metric tons that surface the moon with each one of those missions. The starship setup, you could send 200 tons to the surface of the moon. So that's 20 times the amount. So if you wanted to build a city on the moon, and you could deliver 200 tons of stuff at a time, that's revolutionary. 
The Apollo module took two people down to the surface of the moon. Um, and Starship, there's no reason it couldn't take dozens of people to the moon at a time. Um, and that's just the moon. You know, SpaceX is not building that really for the moon. They're building it to settle Mars. And, and again, this is a launch system that theoretically is entirely reusable, both the first stage rocket and the Starship upper stage. And you've got to refuel it in low Earth orbit. So you've got to launch a bunch of Starships um, to refuel it. But if the whole thing is reusable, then you're talking about a couple million dollars of worth of fuel for each mission. Um, and, and so you could send, you could literally send dozens of people to Mars at a time inside Starship. So as I say, they've got a ways to go, but it's the first time we're building a vehicle that like, so let's, let's just say you, let's say NASA decided tomorrow they wanted to go to Mars and they wanted to use their space launch system rockets. This is the thing that Boeing has built for them over the last decade. And, you know, $20 billion has been spent on it. It's, it's kind of a boondoggle. But let's just say the SLS worked. Um, it costs two to three billion dollars per launch, and it's thrown. It's re, it's not reusable, so it goes in the ocean. And NASA can only build one, or Boeing can only build one a year for NASA to get a mission of like four people to Mars. You need six to eight space launch system launches. So that's like you know twenty twenty billion for the rocket alone. And you can only launch one a year. So you're going to stage missions over eight years um, to do this? I mean, it, it's absolutely insane. Whereas with Starship, yeah. you could theoretically, you know, be launching these several a day and like get a fleet of vehicles, you know, and send, send them on to Mars. And the cost would be less than a single space launch system <laughs> um, flight. So, so that's the future. That's the exciting future that SpaceX is trying to bring about that would be like totally different than the Apollo era or even the modern era. Um, and we'll see if they get there, but that's, that's what they're trying to bring about. Do you ever get to go and just watch the launches? How often, how often are you on the ground watching them? <laughs> Not that often. I'm in Texas and, um, right. so I, I've, and I've been to, a, you know, several launches in Florida, obviously at Kennedy Space Center. Um, and I, I've gone down to South Texas to see Starship launches where SpaceX is, is doing that stuff. But I mean, as a journalist, it's cool to see the launches and there's media who cover that. But the story for me is not standing there watching the launch. It's, it's, it's behind that. They just, it seems so exhilar exhilarating to be there. Um, oh yeah. And- it's, 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 it's amazing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I know it would give me chills. I, I've yet to seen one yet, but um, you gotta yeah, make it I, happen. Where are you based? We're in Denver up here, so I Ooh. guess I didn't say that earlier, huh? We uh, Air Force boys. Yeah, we're Air Force boys. We keep we keep it low to the ground over here. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, we uh, we I have family in New Shimmerta Beach, and my sister lives in Charleston, and they always go together to see some launches. And I just I I love looking back at old photos of the. The, the days when space exploration was really, really exciting to the common public. Not it's way more exciting now, I think. But um, when when the common public was very into it and people would be lining up for miles to watch us launches. Gonna, and, you know, I'm going to push back a little bit on that because I, it, it was public. It was popular. But like mm-hmm. after the first one or two Apollo missions to the moon, people really started tuning it out. Did they? So... Yeah, like some of those Saturn V launches, absolutely, man. Like everyone would show up because that was a huge ass rocket, and it was awesome to see fly. Yeah, and and we'll see that kind of interest again. I don't, I don't think the public interest in space has gone up or down. I think um, it's always been fairly low. Um, I do think, I do think someone like Elon Musk, though, who has this very sort of controversial figure, um, he really. You know, he he does bring more attention to space flight than otherwise it would have had. Um, yeah. Do you think Elon? Do you think as well that Elon is controversial, or do you, from your perspective, is everything he's doing like good, like great? Do you so, do you identify those parts? Yeah, with Elon, you you got to take the good with the bad. Yeah. Um, and there's there's a lot of good, um, and in the main, he is very genuine, in my opinion 
in having been around him and watching very closely what he's done and talking to him and talking to people who've worked with him for a long time. He was very genuine in his concerns about climate change, which is why he does the battery thing and the electric car thing with Tesla. And he's very concerned about existential threats to humanity um, on Earth, be it an asteroid, plague, um, uh, clim- you know, climate change, uh, nuclear war. Um, and so he wants, he thinks that for the long-term good of the species, we need to live on other worlds and the best place to start is Mars. And so that's why he talks about being a multi-planetary species. He's concerned about AI, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, um, like in the matrix, probably not like that, but that's the, that's the kind of thing. And so he does, he does research on AI with Neuralink, um, trying to go down the path toward good AI, which is benevolent toward humanity versus bad AI, which <laughs> wants to <laughs> decide it doesn't need us anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, They'll take so, our so jobs. Like his, his interest in all those areas is genuine and well-meaning. Um, but, you know, he's some, he, he can be kind of an a-hole, right? But, and, 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 and his Twitter persona is not the nicest at times. Um, you know, he can be, can be a jerk, right? Um, but I think part of that can be explained by the fact that, you know, he's disrupted not one, but two industries. Um, the aerospace industry, obviously, um, with SpaceX. Like, like SpaceX has literally turned space launch upside down. It's remarkable how, how they, they've, they've every... Every other company and country is scurrying to catch up. Um, and this was a guy who was launching a small rocket just 13 years ago. Um, and, and, and he's done the same thing with the automotive industry. Um, te- I don't think Tesla has quite disrupted the automotive industry in the way SpaceX has because, you know, they don't have like a, a, a super large market share. But certainly, you know, in, in making electric cars cool, which I think was the the plan. He's achieved that. Um, and, you know, General Motors, Toyota, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Hyundai, I mean, these, these companies, and, and not to mention Russia, um, their launch industry is entirely decimated because of SpaceX. I mean, these are not com- com- companies and countries that are sitting around sort of happy to have a, have a new guy come along and, and talk in a, in a South African accent and, and sort of just waltz in and, and change things. So he's had to fight every step of the way. And so, you know, when he's prickly on Twitter, I think some of the times it's just because he's used to people coming at him. And when people come at him, he pushes back hard. He also doesn't need to have time for anyone because he just is so, he's just leagues ahead of us, you know? So he, he doesn't. That, that's yeah. a great point. Yeah, he, he doesn't really have time for people or things who are not aligned with him on his goals because he figures he has a finite amount of time. He's got all this work he wants to accomplish. And if you're not helping him, then get out of his way. I would assume you're kind of pro, uh, you know, getting space really into the public conversation uh, more consistently or maybe more loudly. Do you find it um, like kind of a, a positive or do you think it's maybe a risky thing like his, his shareholders for some of his companies would see as having him as the like public liaison for space nowadays? I mean, he seems to be the most vocal person that I'm seeing talking about this stuff. Do you think it's risky having a wild card like that do you think he could potentially get in the way of of people being interested by kind of um you know lighting fires in in the wrong places so i can speak much more about space than i can tesla um and and i would say a couple things that first of all he has been hugely inspirational in space to a lot of people so he has made the tent larger for spaceflight enthusiasm. However, with the comments he's made on COVID, with the way he's treated some people, he certainly has turned off sort of the advocacy side of spaceflight. Um, like, he's, for example, there are lots of scientists who's, who are very concerned about 
us going, humans going to Mars and doing what they please there because they, you know, they think Mars, okay, it's, it's all right to explore it, but what right do humans have to sort of mess up in their idea, another world like, like we've done to earth. Then there are the people who think, well, he's just a billionaire trying to escape the planet, doesn't give a crap about earth. And so why should he be allowed to go sort of spread his, detritus on the, on the surface of Mars. Um, so he's definitely turned off some of those communities, but so far because SpaceX has been so successful, he's managed to remain kind of ahead of that criticism. Like, like NASA today, um, SpaceX is essential to NASA's success today. So do, do you like they could, feel like they could, they could, you could not get like an administrator coming in and saying, we've got to end, we've got to end our relationship with SpaceX because I don't trust Elon Musk. I mean, you could, they might be able to unwind that relationship over decades, but it's not like they could do it next week. Mm -hmm. Right. Do, do you personally, I mean, do you think it's a positive seeing him as kind of a, a spearhead or do you think somebody like you'd rather have a, a more reserved purely scientist kind of type that's doing that? Or do you think that having that kind of, crazy excitement infused into the space could be a positive. I think it's on the whole a positive and, and there is no SpaceX without Elon Musk. Um, and so the fact that they became the best launch company in the world and then decided, well, this isn't nearly good enough. So we're going to start investing everything we have in Starship to become a truly revolutionary vehicle. Like that's, that's all Elon, right? And so you don't get the revolutions in spaceflight without Musk constantly pushing forward and sort of doing so brashly. Um, and so my personal opinion is I want to see SpaceX succeed because the future that they're trying to reach in spaceflight is one of low cost access to space that really opens up you know, the heavens for human exploration. Um, and if they don't succeed, it means that Elon's probably not associated with the company. So, I mean, it's, it's, he's, it's really, their success, the company and their success and, and Elon can't really be separated at least right now. Mm -hmm. So then I think it's so interesting that he's been like, he's, he, to me, has taken some of the qualities that used to make rock stars so mysterious and fun to like follow and like t taking it to the business world uh, and obviously not the to the extent that a rock star would do it but he's he's kind of first of all he brought capitalism back into space which like i'm not necessarily mm. like pro whatever i'm not going to make a stance on that right now but um he uh <laughs> but he has he 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 like woke those sleeping giants up and they were kind of yeah. sauntering around with their big feet and dragging their toes and like i remember reading something um a cut like years ago about how like NASA, by the time they launched a rocket, like all the stuff in it was outdated, you know, there was already mm -hmm. like new stuff for it. And so with this, this, um, efficiency and, uh, this hurry up offense that Elon's running, it's making everyone kind of scramble. And I, I love that. And then on top of that, he's smoking weed on Joe Rogan and he's doing just crazy stuff on the side. And I, I, I just love the persona he's got going. If he just started wearing leather, I'd be all on board. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Eric, I got to ask you now. then, pushing beyond that, if we've got Elon as our kind of party boy, James Bond figure <laughs> running around with his uh, his uh, mm. flamethrowers, then you've got to have a villain. <laughs> and we all know that the bald headed cat kind of petting villain <laughs> is Bezos coming into <laughs> the space yes. now with uh, with Blue Moon. Uh, what, what do you think of that? I, I feel like it's kind of, I mean, to me, it seems like a, a scary kind of concept that it's just like, you've got this kind of Napoleonic dude coming in just like crabby. Cause he's not invited to the party and he's just throwing as much <laughs> money as he can at it and just seeing what happens. Do you think that's a good thing that there's just money being infused into the industry? Or do you think that is potentially risky having people like that coming into it? So, so Jeff Bezos, who I've talked to as well, is coming at this from the right place. His heart, 
I think is genuine in that he thinks humans, I need to be exploring too. And he, he, he has a little, di- little bit different vision than Elon. He thinks that most of the heavy industry ought to be moved off Earth so we can make Earth more of a garden um, planet, which I think is a pretty decent vision. Wow. Um, and, and, and he and Elon are simpatico in the sense that they both believe that the essential first step is, is low-cost access to space. And so that's why they're both building reusable rockets. But something happened to him over the last four or five years. Um, he, when Amazon Prime started going and started getting into Hollywood, Jeff Bezos spent a lot of time in Hollywood too. And I think that's, that's changed him. Um, and somewhere along the way in the last five years, Blue Origin has become less about disrupting the industry and really innovating and more along the lines of a traditional space contractor, like a Boeing or a Lockheed Martin, in, in terms of they're only really going to work on programs if they can get government funding for them. Um, and so in that sense, it's been somewhat disappointing to watch his evolution because I think if he and Musk were, were competing directly, and, and I think Bezos would say he's competing with Musk, but Musk is 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 – you know, is lapping him, um, you know, in terms of what, what SpaceX is doing versus Blue Origin. I, w- I think competition would be good. And the industry would like to, and, and, and this people in the space industry would like to see that competition. It's just been super one-sided today. I don't get what's behind that, though. I've always been curious about that because it's not like Elon is sitting there crafting every rocket, designing every rocket all by himself. Like, He's hiring very smart people. And I've heard you talk, to, talk about before that part of the what makes Elon so successful is his rigorous hiring. But shouldn't you would think that Jeff Bezos isn't that um, isn't that far behind in that concept? Like why? How? And he has just as many, if not more resources. Why? Why? Why can't he keep up? Well, I wrote a book about that, JJ. Um, I know. Tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> so so one, one of the reasons I wrote Liftoff is I wanted to understand why SpaceX had been so successful. And so I went back to the very beginning of the company's origin in the, in the first six years. Um, and I, I think, you know, I was really able to show through the hiring practice you mentioned, but both also just by sort of the sweeping vision that, that Elon hewed to and, and the company's bought in, or his employees bought into. Um, they are different. They're definitely different engineers. Um, Elon, I think, is a much better engineer than, than Jeff Bezos is. Um, and he just also has been much more involved in his rocket company than Bezos has. Um, you know, it, Jeff was, I think, working one day or less at Blue Origin over the last five years a week. And, you know, Elon was either going through Tesla hell or, or spending a lot of time at SpaceX. I think he, he probably does three or four days of SpaceX work a week. And it's, it's like super long days. Like he'll get started, you know, late morning and go till after midnight. Um, and that's, you know, that's most of his, his life. Um, and I think Jeff, as I say, has, has been more immersed in the Hollywood scene and kind of been enjoying some of the fruits of his hard work. I mean, Amazon is an, is an amazing company, but running a business like Amazon is very different than running a, a rocket company. That's Do you think that's going to potentially shift more for the worse now that Bezos has stepped back from his role at Amazon? Do you think he's going to invest more time in, in, into space? And The hope is that he does, that he, that he gets involved and, and pushes them back more toward his founder's mentality, which was much more disruptive as opposed to, Hey, let's, let's build things that win us government contracts and let's use traditional lobbying to win those contracts as opposed to sort of superlative engineering. It's, as I say, he's blue origin has, has become not sort of this upstart company like SpaceX, but much more part of the, the establishment, which moves much more slowly. 
I just want to point out that, uh, Corey, you're a true bozo. You called it Blue Moon when you first brought it up. Yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> they, have, they, have a land, they have a lander called Blue Moon, so that's not entirely... Oh, you're not too far wrong. off. <laughs> I thought you were talking about the lander. Yeah. <laughs> I thought he was talking about beer. Uh-huh. <laughs> I like, I'll have one. It could be beer, too, yeah. <laughs> and there's another space company called Sierra Nevada, so there you go. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> we, dude, shoot, I should have seen that coming. We should have done like a... We should have named a space company off of every beer. That would have been a good one. <laughs> Eric, do um, you do you look at space romantically or is it is it solely like kind of a, a you know, a job? Is it a, a, a scientific <laughs> thing or, or, you know, do you still have that like yeah. spark that got you into it? Yeah, I mean, my coverage is is pretty is not like a straightforward journalist. It's not, you know down by the book, like very covering it very straight, like an associated press or a space news. I'm pretty passionate in my coverage. And like, if you seem to be acting out of the interest of the space flight enterprise, and by that, I mean, pushing the ball forward, not trying to sort of suck down tax dollars to, to please shareholders. Um, you know, if you're advancing space flight, then, then, then I'm much more likely to write favorably about you. And if you're sort of in it for the government contracts and, 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 and don't really care about the living products on time or on budget, then, then I'm much more critical because yeah, I have that passion. You know, I was born a few years after the last Apollo landing on the moon and I'd like to see us do something greater than that in my lifetime. And, and, you know, let's get on with it already. And so I'm much, much more interested in the, the new space industry, which is, is trying to disrupt things than I am sort of the old space industry, which has kept us in low Earth orbit for 50 years. Is that What's your you end look- goal? Yeah. What, what do you, what do you see? You say like, keep pushing forward. What, what do you really want to see in your lifetime? Um, I mean, I'd love to see a human settlement on Mars. I mean, I'd love to see a, a lunar base. Um, I'd love to see, you know, people able to buy a, a ticket to an orbital hotel for less than, you know, a hundred, you know, $50 million. I mean, it, I'd like to see, I, I, I subscribe to the idea that if humans are, are kind of confined to this planet forever, we will eventually reach some kind of stasis because earth can only support so many people. There's that only a limited amount of natural resources. And, you know, I'm not a Malthusian by any, any stretch of the imagination, but you know, at some point humanity is going to run into that bar of natural resources and it's going to push back and we're going to start shrinking as a species. The only way to really solve that problem is to get humans off of earth. And, you know, you start at the moon and Mars and, you know, eventually we'll have technologies to go to other stars, but those are you know, centuries away probably. So we've, but we've got to take the first step. Um, so I'm very much for like, let's get people out there and see what's possible. Yeah. If you had the opportunity to go to space, would you? Hell yeah. I mean, you know, we've talked about blue origin and not favorably, but they've got this new shepherd system that they launch in West Texas. Um, and it's, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it's a small rocket. It goes up, you get several minutes of free flight and you come down. Um, I think the original, you know, the price for that ride, which is only about 10 minutes is probably going to start out at seven or 800,000 dollars. It takes you above a hundred kilometers into space, but you know, I could see that coming down to a hundred thousand or less eventually. Um, so that, I mean, that's, that's, that's a pretty good first step because there's, you've never before been able to buy a ticket, you know, to go to space like that on short order. And that's what they're that's what they're working towards. That's a, that's a, that's a decent first step. I'm with you that I would, I would definitely do it if I had the means, but would you be the first or second person to do it on any? Oh on yeah. Any, on, on that really? vehicle. Yes. That, that vehicle, they've flown it like 15 times and it's every mission has been like, they've nailed it. Um, and so I feel that's a very, in terms of space, space, space systems, that's about as safe as they come. Yeah. Um, I'd be, I'd be a little more reticent to ride, um, on Virgin Galactic's spaceship, um, <laughs> because they've had some, they've had some more problems with that. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't want to say too much because they're a publicly traded company, but there's a book called test gods that, that just came out that goes into some of the, um, some of the sort of the hairiness of, of 
those flights. Um, so yeah, I, but, but the blue origin system looks rock, rock solid to me. Yeah. So they what flew are, it 15 times before they even, um, before they even put anyone in it. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Oh, they, wow. They've flown it, launched it, the rocket lands, the capsule lands, and then they fly it again. It's, it's been, it's been very impressive. I'm still watching you do it before I do it. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you feel like there are any uh developments that are that are really bad harmful so like stuff that you don't want to see happen that's kind of in the process oh, yeah. you know oh, all yeah. this like yeah there's lots of stuff like this space all this asteroid mining stuff that to me sounds so crazy like it's just a big um money grab for the ultra rich like if they're like if we can get to yeah, space yeah. and mine all these uncommon gems you know, we'll bring you don't, them back. You don't like have to worry about asteroids. You don't, you don't have to worry about that for a while. We're we're pretty far away from asteroid mining, I think. You know, the things that concern me are like the militarization of space. Um, you know, it, it, the, there are these things called anti-satellite tests where the United States or Russia or China or India will fire a surface-based missile up at a satellite in space to make sure they can destroy it. Right. They want to demonstrate that capability is kind of like a deterrent to other countries. It's kind of like the new nuclear. Is that why my Wi-Fi went out today? No, but, <laughs> but you know, it, it, so we're junking we're, with these tests. We're kind of adding debris to, to various orbits around Earth. And then, you know, SpaceX is putting up all these Starlink satellites, which is going to provide Internet around the planet. But, but, but I mean, that's adding a lot more satellites and it's not just SpaceX. Um, Amazon is doing it. Uh, OneWeb is doing it. China is going to do it. Europe may do it. I mean, so there's going to be just thousands and thousands more satellites and there's just more potential for collisions. And so, so, you know, orbital debris is, is a big concern. And as you get more commercial activity going on, you just increase the risk of, of problems in space. So there are definitely going to be growing pains. Um, as we get into this new era, um, and there's lots of, there's lots of things to be concerned about, but, but I'm very much of the school of, we need to get out there and do it and try it and see what works as opposed to, you know, sitting on earth and, and theorizing about it forever. So space force is a no go for you. You don't need, you don't need that. I mean, space force really was just a rebranding of what the air force did in space. So it's not like it's a huge change in my opinion. And, and the Space Force does a lot of good things um, like they do. They track the satellite debris, right? So they're, they're the ones that sort of are performing these analyses of potential collisions and, and warning NASA and other agencies of, of the things like that. So the so Space Force is not, not bad by any stretch. Um, but I, I was very concerned about sort of, um, by the way, the Trump administration whatever your political leanings are, was fantastic for civil space. I mean, the, the, their administrator for NASA, Jim Bridenstine, was great. Um, Mike Pence seemed to really care about space, and, and, and they did some pretty good things. Um, but, but one thing they did that, 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 that the President Trump did and, and Pence did was talked about space dominance. And that, to me, was a little more troubling, and that was kind of the military side of things, where, like, they wanted the United States to project you know, we're stronger than, than anyone in space and, and you know, you know, we're going to destroy you and <laughs> kind of and that, that really turned off some of our partners like in Europe, turned them the wrong way. And so it, I think it kind of accelerated the militarization of space. And, and so that's that's not a great trend. What do you think about the name? Space Force? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it sounds kind of like a Sunday morning cartoon, but I mean, it's fine. It's OK. I mean, it's it's. it's <laughs> It, I mean, the, the, other, the other name that was trotted around for it was Space Corps, like the oh, Marine Corps, better. but Space Corps. That's much better. You like Space Corps? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Space Force to me sounds silly. I'm thinking Space Force, Air Force, Water Force, Earth Force. It's just, it's, yeah, I would have named yeah. it Coors Light. I think that's what I would have named Coors Light? <laughs> just yeah, we got Blue Moons. <laughs> the, first, uh, <laughs> the first corporate sponsorship for a, a military yeah. agency. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they would pick Coors so. Light, unfortunately. <laughs> I don't think Coors Light would do it, but I mean, yeah, wait, Space Core, Space Coors. I mean, yeah. oh <laughs> my gosh. Way when to get on the marketing the team. turn blue. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> They're silver on Earth, but blue in space. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Space Coors it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, that devolved quickly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, you talked about it sometime, Eric. Um, the the quarrels between the big space contracted agencies and kind of like the <laughs> almost like Peaky Blinders, Watergate type stuff that was going on between them and things people have been caught for for like stealing documents, patents, and things like mm, that. Yeah. I'm saying random words here, but I'm hoping leading you into some saying something. Um, is that is that is it get, does it get darker than that? How dark does it get between those companies? I'd like to think it gets crazy, but I don't know. You know, it's it's interesting because all of these companies are ultimately cooperating um, through various NASA programs. So like Lockheed Martin builds satellites that launch on SpaceX rockets. Um, Boeing and Lockheed Martin have a joint launch company called United Launch Alliance. Like they both own 50% of that company. Um, SpaceX and United Launch Alliance both use you know, components from the same supplier. So there's separation, there's, there's combined, but I, I can tell you that there is a, a, a strong hatred towards SpaceX from a lot of these other companies because they really have come in and upset the Apple cart. Um, I mean, they, they've, they've like taken lots of business away from these other companies and, and really embarrassed them um, by, by doing contracts you know, faster and cheaper and in some cases better than, than what, what came before. Um, but yeah, before there was SpaceX, Boeing and Lockheed Martin were spying on one another. And, and I mean, it's just, it's, it's, uh, I don't know all the ins and outs of corporate espionage, but, but yeah, behind the scenes, these companies are knifing one another in the back whenever possible. Interesting. I was, ho- I was hoping to have some details on it. You've been on the yeah, were you ever privy okay. to any uh, interesting? Did you ever see something that you thought was a, a little bit off? Did you? Uh, I mean, you were obviously digging deep into to SpaceX. Uh, did you encounter some things that you thought seemed a little fishy? I mean, I mean, <laughs> no one's no one in the government's listening to this podcast. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just stuff like. Like a government official, like maybe you're responsible for for awarding military launch contracts for the U.S. government. And like you make like you're the presiding officer over, you know, 12 to 15 launches that that go in a block per purchase to United Launch Alliance. So this contract's worth billions of dollars. And then six months later, you're you take a job there as like a senior vice president of something or other. I mean, that, that really stinks, um, Mm -hmm. in my opinion. So you see that kind of stuff happening in the industry. Yeah. Do you, so you always, you always seem like with space in general, and when anyone's covering space, space, most of their, um, most of like your efforts are focused on the future and what's happening, what the technology is. How, how much do you find yourself like looking backwards and thinking about things that had happened or not at all? Oh, I, I look back all the time because, yeah. you know, you, you, if, if companies are trying things, it's always interesting to know if it's been tried before and it, were they successful, were they not successful? So, yeah, I mean, you know, understanding your spaceflight history is a very important part of, of understanding the future. And one of the weird things about NASA is that because what they were doing in like, you know, with, with the space shuttle and to some extent the International Space Station, which was very difficult, but, but not all that inspiring to the public. They spent a lot of time looking back. So they would do the big to-do about the Apollo 30th anniversary and then the Apollo 40th anniversary. And then this couple years ago, we had the Apollo 50th anniversary of the landing on the moon in July of, of 2019. So, yeah, I, you know, but I, I, I look back, but I'm very much more interested in what's coming in the future. Um, I heard you, or E, did you have a question? I saw you popping up. Um, you go first. <laughs> All right. I, I, uh, mine's kind of off topic, but, um, I, are you, do you play any role in development of like STEM programs locally? Or I, I've, I've heard you talk about being an advocate for them. Um, I think in one podcast, one Aaron podcast, but, um, I, what's your, what's your ideology on, on STEM programs? I, I feel like someone like you would be very invested in this kind of I am in my outreach more 
is more so through the weather side of things. So I'll speak mm-hmm. to schools, um, elementary and middle schools primarily kind of about the weather and, and what the careers are like in that and, and if they're interested in it. So it's more, it's more through that than, than anything else. But yeah, obviously science education is enormously important and, and, you know, we, we, we really are falling behind other countries in terms of, of churning out scientists and engineers. And, and, and that's why it's important, I think, for people to be inspired by what they see. Um, Apollo inspired a generation of engineers. Um, and, and now I think SpaceX is leading the way in this new space charge that is, is hopefully bringing on a new, a new generation. I hope so. Are you a sci-fi fan then? Do you oh, like yeah. sci-fi? You yeah. Yeah. Awesome. What, what do are you your want? favorites? Uh, I mean, I like Star Trek, <laughs> but I, mean, I read a lot. I read a lot of stuff. Uh, like, uh, I mean, probably my favorite is Asimov, the foundation series. Um, Got it right here. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing how they televise that. I guess it's going to be on Apple TV. I don't, I don't, I don't watch that much television, um, but I'm, I'm looking forward to that series. Yeah. Where do you draw the line in movies? What do you not like? Boy, I could, I, it's probably because I'm too old, but I never got into the Marvel comic universe. Uh, I, I could have guessed that. What <laughs> <laughs> you lose? Or, I mean, what's the deal? I no, 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 I get, it's just like, you're a very smart guy and Marvel <laughs> is pretty dumb. Like you have to turn off your brain for Marvel. So like, <laughs> <laughs> so, like I was, and I like Marvel, so I don't know what that says about me, but <laughs> you're pretty dumb. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not, not at all. I, just, I don't know. I just, I like the guardians of the galaxies movies, I guess, but um, it just, it just, yeah, became, about space. it just became a little too much. Yeah, I guess. I get that. I get that. What are, you, what are you doing um, when you're not working? I was going to ask that. Sorry, Jay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I work too much trying to spend some time with my family or bike riding or running, stuff like that. I'm pretty boring. I'm a very boring yeah. guy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think space is boring. I think if you're, if you're very, very into space and that consumes your whole life, I think out of most things, that's probably the most productive. It, yeah. it's, certainly, it's certainly one of my passions. There's no doubt about that. How are you, you away f- Oh, go I was, ahead. I was going to say, how are you, um, try, are you, are you actively trying to interest your kids in space or is it something that you just have that's there that you're hoping they pit, like kind of latch onto, you know, like what's the, 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 your idea for how you get the next generation excited. I've got two daughters in their teens and I've just kind of let them do their own thing. Um, I've exposed them to, to opportunities like launches and, you know, going to this, this space center and, and, you know, talking to them about interesting things that are coming up, but I certainly haven't pushed them. I don't think either of them are really as, as fascinated by space as I was. I mean, I'm a, I'm a little disappointed in that, but I mean, I'm very happy for them to go their own way. You should get a, a, a TikTok page going that might catch their attention. <laughs> it will certainly catch my 13 year old's attention. She's was, is addicted to TikTok. For yeah, sure. they all are. They, are, they, they are, honestly yeah. all are. You, you got it. You'll just have to, to make a TikTok dance that, that, you know, incorporates space somehow. Go once you, I mean, if you, if you go viral, your daughter's going to think you're uh, uh, just like you're, you'll be cooler than Elon Musk. Yeah. I mean, they are both surprised that Elon Musk gives me the time of day. Yeah. You're on, you're on the right track. That is the right track. Yeah. <laughs> Next time you're with him, you got to do a dance with him, I guess. Ooh, that yeah. one does not ask you on to dance. <laughs> <laughs> probably not going to happen. <laughs> you were talking about times that he would throw in like uh, disruptor questions to kind of throw you off your, your guard. You could start start countering him with those. Yeah, I could say, hey, let's, uh, let's, let's. no, that, that's during the interview process. And, and yeah, it's, it's apparently pretty intense because um, he wants to, he's not messing around. He wants to know if you're going to help him get to Mars or not. And, and he'll, he'll press you. Do you think we'd withstand an Elon interview process or would we crumble? You guys wouldn't get in the door. It's basically. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they'd kick you out of the way. Oh, I'm man. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Was it the Marvel movies? 
Oh, uh, well, I know, I don't know if he likes the Marvel movies. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it'll be some, I'll, I'll do something to piss him off. <laughs> um, I know we're e- nearing the end of an hour. Um, do you, are, do you have any, any more works, um, coming up? What's, uh, what's next for Eric Berger? You got, got some big, I mean, if, if Elon keeps moving, you have more books to write, right? You know, I'm really interested in, I think the most important thing that happened in space over this past decade was the recovery, refurbishment, and reuse of of orbital rockets. Mm -hmm. What we saw with the Falcon 9, I think that was the really essential step toward the revolution in space we were talking about. And so I'm probably going to write a book about sort of how SpaceX did that. Same kind of way through liftoff, through the first person accounts of those who were there and sort of you know, in stringing it together, a, a pretty, pretty compelling narrative. Nice. Well, I'll be looking forward to that. And, um, Berg, I've got, uh, one question for you before, <laughs> yeah. uh, before you go. Uh, I got two questions actually. Would you like the, the soft one or the hard one? <laughs> First. <laughs> go, your choice, a dealer's choice. Uh, we're, we're all well, surprised in this one, Eric. <laughs> I'm curious. I'll, the theme today was a lot of talk of the future and bringing things to Mars. So like saving the planet and all that, uh, you hang out around these billionaires who have the power for, to make serious, substantial change on earth, but they're focused on other planets. What's your opinion on where they're putting their money? And do you think that just settling Mars is going to help at all? Or is it just going to become the same thing as earth, which is, you know, ex- extreme disproportionate poverty and suffering. That's a great question, and that's a very deep question. Um, and and yeah, I'm a little conflicted about the fact that it's the billionaires who are who are making this change and who are making the greatest change. The fact of the matter is that spaceflight is not cheap. It's enormously expensive. So only if you have a lot of personal wealth can you really start to affect change in space outside of working with the, the government. Um, so I think it's by default, you know, billionaires, but, but I, I definitely think there's a perception that, that the space thing is just boys and their toys and it's their playthings for the billionaires, you know, sort of beyond the mega yacht. Um, and that's a real, I think that's a real perception that new space has to battle because that's not really what commercial space is about. Um, it really is about increasing access to space. And yeah, the richest people will be able to go first, but eventually it should open up to more people. Um, you asked a very multi-layered question. And I, I think the other the other thing I would comment on is, I think you're saying, are we going to trash Mars like we trashed Earth? Um, and I think that's what humans are. It's in our nature to sort of, spread out and claim things and then fight over those resources. And that's, that's kind of how we've always been. And so I would expect that behavior to, to continue. And and I would just leave you with this. The very first thing the Apollo lander did when it got to the moon in July of 1969 was jettison its trash. So yeah. like, I mean, that's deep. There you go. Yeah, that's fair. It's kind of part of the game. Was that the hard one or the easy one? Yeah, not for yeah. the hard one, Eli. <laughs> that was, that was yeah. I hope that was the yeah. easy one. Yeah. I want to hear what the hard one was. <laughs> uh, my other one is you think about burgers a lot. <laughs> Your last one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Oh boy! Wow, the recording just randomly stopped. I have no idea what happened. <laughs> <laughs> that was definitely the hard question. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps you up at night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not really. I mean, if I, if I think about a burger, I'll go get one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty capable guy. <laughs> There's Uber Eats now. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to Elon, we got PayPal. I could pay someone for it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did you feel like your answer got, your question got answered? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Derek, my man. Handsome. Thank you so much for uh, com- coming on with us. We really appreciate you. I uh, I felt bad when I started doing the research. I mean, we've had this book for months, um, 
when I started doing the research about a week ago, I uh, I was like, this guy's too smart for us. We're <laughs> we're in trouble. But uh, <laughs> but the the goal, like I said, the goal of this podcast is to kind of like get two ends kind of in touch, find a common ground, maybe spark someone's curiosity. So no, I think it's I, I one of the reasons that I wrote the book the way I did. It was not written for the real the true believers in space it was written you dumbed it down for us no, no I, didn't, I didn't dumb it down but i i did try to write it in a more engaging way um to read more like a thriller than like a let's nerd out about the schematics of the falcon one rocket second stage because it was just so revolutionary no it was more like you know these guys we're getting their butts kicked. They almost fail multiple times, but here's how they kind of pulled through in the end. Um, so I, I'm very much down with, with trying to, to spread the message of space, good and bad, to, to a wider audience. I think it's more good than bad. Cool. And we agree. So, um, yeah, thank, thank you so much for uh, coming on. For anyone who's listening, grab a copy of Launch. I'll be grabbing an audiobook copy of it um mainly because i have bad eyesight uh and <laughs> i uh i as long as you guys are ready to go i'm gonna i'm gonna sign it up sign us off here i'm ready to go to space